One song can spark a moment. One whisper can wake the dream. One tree can start a forest. One word can herald spring. One smile begins a friendship. One moment can make one fall in love. One star can guide a ship at sea. One word frames the goal. One vote can change a nation. One sunbeam lights a room. One candle wipes out darkness. One laugh will conquer gloom. One step must start each journey. One word must start each prayer. One hope will raise our spirits. One touch can show you care. One voice can speak with wisdom. One heart can know what's true. One life can make a difference. You see, it's simply up to you. First of all, my condolences to all of you. And now, we want to commend Kelly to her creator and the same creator to give us consolation in ways that only God can give, but also what our faith gives us. We put ourselves before God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we believe that all the ties of friendship and affection which bind us in our lives, they do not end with death. Confident that the Lord always remembers the good we have done and forgives our sins, let us take a moment of silence to pray for Kelly. Let us pray. Lord our God, the death of our beloved in faith, Kelly, recalls our human condition and the shortness of our lives on earth. But for those who believe in your love, death is not the end, nor does it destroy the bonds that bind us in our lives. We share the faith of your son's disciples and the hope of the children of God. Bring the light of Christ's resurrection to this time of testing and pain as we pray for Kelly and for those who love her through Christ our Lord. Now we are going to listen to the first reading. A reading from the book of Lamentations. My soul is deprived of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. I tell myself my future is lost, all that I hoped for from the Lord. The thought of my homeless poverty is wormwood and gall. Remembering it over and over leaves my soul downcast within me. But I will call this to mind as my reason to have hope the favors of the Lord are not exhausted. His mercies are not spent. They are renewed each morning, so great is his faithfulness. My portion is the Lord, says my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Good is the Lord to one who waits for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good to hope in silence for the saving help of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The responsorial psalm will be, The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my help. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Before whom shall I shrink? The Lord is my light and my salvation. There is one thing I ask of the Lord, for this I long to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to savor the sweetness of the Lord, to behold his temple. The, the Lord, Lord is, is my light and my salvation. salvation. O Lord, hear my voice when I call. 
Have mercy and answer. It is your face, O Lord, that I seek. Hide not your face. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I am sure I shall see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Hope in him. Hold firm and take heart. Hope in the Lord. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and said, Father, my disciples are your gift to me. I wish that where I am, they also may be with me, that they may see my glory that you gave me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Right, yes, Father. The world also does not know you, but I know you. And they know that you sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will make it known that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Jesus. Allow me to repeat myself by saying, my deepest condolences to all of you, because the first reading we hear from the book of Lamentations, the word lamentation sounds so strong, but it has that part which brings us to that awareness that throughout the centuries, for people who really love someone, when the time comes to separate, our souls are separate don't feel peace anymore. And so the terminology used, the phrase used, my soul is deprived of peace. I'm going to speak about Kelly, but also allow me to speak about my brother. <laughs> Some years back, my brother died. He was younger, 27, 20, no, 29. And he left six children. He worked so hard. <laughs> And somebody sent me a card. I have told this story before. Many people sent me cards, but there was that particular card which I didn't like. Why? Because the friend who sent it to me said, Joseph, rather than f focusing on the time you would have passed with your brother, focus on the time you, you lived with him. I didn't like the card because we had so many dreams. Guess what? Three years after, the only card that I remember is that one. <laughs> All the cards, I don't remember them. <laughs> and what was said, I don't even remember it. So I had to do the hard work, what to do what the card said, and said, you know what? My life is what it is because of what I shared with my brother. He's the one I got into fights with. <laughs> we didn't agree on some things. We lived together with grandma, and I was reading about Kelly, really. She loved grandpa, now may they be together. And I felt cheated when he passed so young. With this said, I compare the story. I think all of us, it, was, it is very hard for parents to bury a child, for a sibling, for a child, for whoever is related, for a friend, for a teacher, their parent, the children you teach. So I find this phrase very fitting for all of us. If we feel my soul is deprived of peace and I have forgotten what happiness is all about. That captures in many ways our deep pain that we feel. And the pain is intensified because the more we love, the more we feel the pain. The same reading, however, takes a different direction. And, but I will call this to mind as my reason to have hope that the favors of the Lord are not exhausted, his mercies are not spent. 
Now, when I look at now, if my nephews and nieces, I say, okay, my brother, thank you for leaving me these gifts that I treasure. We give thanks to God that Logan is with us and we continue to pray for one another. So that summarizes the first reading and the prayer we get from the responsorial psalm. For this I long, to live in the house of the Lord, to savor his sweetness, the sweetness of the Lord, and to behold his, tem his temple. May this be the prayer that now she may enjoy the eternal vision of God, and where she has gone, we hope to follow. Lastly, the gospel. Jesus says it in the context before leaving this world. We have that kind of talk as if he's leaving the world, yet he's with us. But addressing the heavenly father in prayer, looks at his, his disciples and says, these are my gifts to me. I'm tempted to think after reading the obituary that Kelly too is saying, Lord, all these people you see are your gifts to me. She was a woman who was generous and continues to be generous and also with a heart of thanksgiving. May she now, may we join her to give thanks to God that she came into our lives, touched it. Of course, my brother sometimes gave me a lot of pain. I have to say, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. But I learned it to live with our disagreements. He put himself into trouble for some time for some things. And had, I had to say, okay, Lord, but you know what? He's still my brother. I'm going to hug him and thank you for putting him into my life because now I know how to resolve conflict. <laughs> I learned it by, by getting into some fights with him. <laughs> okay, that's the topic for another day. But we continue to pray. Right here, Father, the world also does not know you. We pray that really we may know our journey continues that we may come to know Christ, to come to know God, even in our different religions, to, to have a mind of a creator. And as I also read, she was, a, she was proud to be identified as Irish. Is that right? Okay. So I have learned from the Irish that you have to live your life well, so that a, a priest may not have to tell lies at your funeral. <laughs> so live your life well, so that a priest may not have to tell lies at your funeral. <laughs> so Kelly, as a proud Irish, we give thanks to God for all the people he has, she has touched, and now all these good things we speak about, they are not made up, but she has lived them. For that we are grateful. And also, um, there's an uh, I have lived with many Irish people, so now you can know why. I, and they tell me things and I keep them. One said, there's a prayer. May your soul be in heaven an hour before the devil knows about your death. <laughs> so this is what we pray, that Kelly is now in heaven. And also, we are parting with her in many ways. But may the Lord hold her into the palm of her hands. Sometimes I put on green and people say, are you Irish on St. Patrick? And I'm saying, not yet. <laughs> so keep these traditions and the joys she has brought to you. And now we entrust her. Talk to the creator by this, through these prayers. Please respond, Lord have mercy. Let us turn to Christ Jesus with confidence and faith in the power of his cross and resurrection. Risen Lord, pattern of our life forever, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Promise and image of what we shall be, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Son of God, who came to destroy sin and death, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Word of God, who delivered us from the fear of death, Lord have mercy. Crucified Lord, forsaken in death and raised in glory, Lord have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, gentle shepherd, who brings rest to our souls, 
and peace. Give joy to carry forever. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you bless those who mourn and are in pain. Bless Kelly's family and friends who gather around her today. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Now we take one last moment of silence to pray for her, to pray for ourselves, and even if there's nothing to say, just to maintain that moment of silence. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have Now we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We visualize Jesus on the cross and Mary being there and John the Apostle. We are there now, almost at Calvary. And Mary, a mother who accompanies us in our pain and in our joys, we invoke her intercession as she has an experience of consoling those who are in pain. Hail Mary, full of, full of grace, grace. The Lord is with thee. Grace to among you. And blessed is the fruit of thine, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sins, now and at the of our death. Amen. We humbly ask you to comfort your servants in their grief and to receive Kelly into the arms of your mercy. You alone are the Holy One, your mercy itself. By dying, you unlocked the gates of life for those who believe in you. Forgive Kelly all her sins and grant her a place of happiness, light, and peace in the kingdom of your glory forever and ever. Amen. Eternal rest grant to her, O Lord, and that perpetual light shine upon her. Eternal rest grant to her, O Lord, and that perpetual light shine upon her. Eternal rest grant to her, O Lord, and that perpetual light shine upon her. May Kelly and all the faithful departed through the mass of God rest in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, you are attentive to the voices of our pleading. Let us find in your Son comfort in our sadness certainty in our doubt, and courage to live through this hour. Make our faith strong through Christ our Lord. I you know these days are so heavy for all of you, but we hold on to God, the one who sustains us. And as time goes, we remain with the words of St. Paul, comfort one another, comfort one another. Many people mourning the same person, but each in your own way. May the Lord console you. On her behalf, I want to thank you for coming into her life. And on your behalf, I want to thank you for coming into her life. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May the Matter God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
time permits, I will consolidate with Father, Father Tim tomorrow. We will see. Really, we continue to pray for one another. It is a very hard time, but as I say, one hand washes the other. <laughs> we continue to be there for one another. <laughs> God bless you. Again, Father, thank you for your always, always beautiful homilies. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. If a cloud be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less, as well as if a promontory were, as well as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were. Any man's death, death diminishes me, because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Scott didn't expect to make that phone call last week. None of you expected to get that phone call. And yet here we are. As some of you walked by, I had the order of Christian funerals out on that podium. And those of you who know me know that very rarely do I not do something that has some type of meaning behind it. Normally, even though there is nothing here at the funeral home tomorrow, normally before we depart for church, I would do the traditional transfer prayers. And I'm going to read you this gospel because I think it's a good way to introduce our speakers. I think it's a good way to get us in um, the thought that we need to be. Many of you have probably heard this, but not at a funeral. It's not very commonly read at a funeral, but it, it all comes from the same book, right? You can find meaning in anything. But this is uh, from Matthew 5, commonly known as the Beatitudes. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, he, disciples, he came to him, and he began to teach them all by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So, I get it. Blessed are they who mourn. They'll be comforted. That's kind of like, all right, funeral, right? What are you talking about, Deej? He began to teach them, saying. She was a teacher. She touched many, many students. I want you to hear some words when you pull the other stuff out of it because the age group she had was tough. Fourth grade, right? Yes. I remember fourth grade. I think my teachers were very happy when I went to fifth. <laughs> but nevertheless, that's a time where you start to think a little more abstractly, right? Where your teachers start to show you things that are a little outside of the box. You've already learned your, well, you don't do script anymore, right, in school? No, yeah, I don't get that. Um, neither here nor there. But you got the, the stuff down. You got your letters. You got your numbers. You got your multiplication tables. You got that stuff, right? So they start to teach you a little more of the abstract world. And one of the things that I remember about fourth grade was they taught us to look at things not necessarily as they are, and pick out things to make us understand. So hear these words. Meek, inherit the land. Hunger, satisfied. Merciful, shown mercy. Clean a heart, see God. Peacemakers, children of God. You're smiling because you know where I'm going. Sometimes we take the noise of the world and we forget the simplest, basic teachings. But the carry I've heard so much about 
And yes, I was walking around today, straightening the chairs, picking up the tissues, making sure you had water. But I was also looking at walking around because I wanted to hear the story so that when I got up here, I could make sure that I was speaking with some form of authority based on everything that I heard from the immediate family. And look, everybody's sanctified in death. You know that. But when everybody is walking around talking, saying the same exact things, it's got to be true. Genuine compassion, genuine love, genuine selflessness. All the things that you hear in the Beatitudes from someone who is going to heaven. Someone who gets it, someone who gets God's plan, someone who pushes the noise away. And someone who isn't perfect. Such a powerful, powerful gospel. So that's what I would have read tomorrow, but appropriate for now, because some of you have asked me why it was open to this specific page. One other reading before our speakers. Logan, the two things I'm going to say today really are for you. If anybody else wants to listen, they can. But it's really for you. Number one, I'm sure you're tired of everybody telling you how brave you are and all that stuff. Yeah, I had a feeling. But you are. And I have not been as impressed with a young man in a long time. So when they start to make you work, you come see me. We can find a job for you around here. You look good in a suit, too. But I get it as much as anybody can get anybody else's grief, which means I can't. But you're probably tired of hearing how strong you are, how brave you are, how good. You're probably a lot pissed off, a little angry, a little sad, happy in some ways. Probably all these feelings that don't make sense that they go together, but they're happening right now. I'm going to tell you, you're not crazy. Just keep talking to, to dad, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles. Just keep talking to your friends. Nobody's going to judge you, and you are definitely not off the rail. Everybody I know that goes through grief has all these weird things running in their brain when they don't seem to go together. Like, how can you be happy and sad in the same sentence? It doesn't work. But what did I tell you when you first came in? I want you to leave here with hope today. And this is something that I keep under my desk. And I'm going to read it now for all of us, but really for you. And I hope you remember it. And when you're having one of those moments where you just don't know how you're going to put the next foot in front of the other and go forward, you think of this. It's simply entitled Hope by Nikki Bannis. If you only carry one thing throughout your entire life, let it be hope. Let it be hope that better things are always ahead. Let it be hope that you can get through even the toughest of times. Let it be hope that you are stronger than any challenge that comes your way. Let it be hope that you are exactly where you are meant to be right now and that you're on the same path that you're supposed to be. Because during these times, hope will be the very thing that carries you through. I'm going to ask Carrie's sister, Sarah, to come forward and share with us some of her thoughts. Carrie is my big sister. She's older than me by about 10 years, and I have looked up to her my entire life. <clears throat> As a little girl, I would glow with pride when you all <laughs> would tell me I looked just like her. Uh, in middle school, I felt so cool when she would pick me up in her Jeep with the top down, wearing a tube top, and the bandana in her hair, always smelling like coconut, and her music blaring. Sometimes she would even let me hold the wheel from the passenger seat while she was fixing her hair. One year, uh, she took me with her to work at the Limited clothing store for Take Your Child to Work Day. She let me try on almost all of the clothes in the store. At the end of her shift, she bought me every outfit that I liked and definitely spent more than she made working that day. As a teen, I always wanted to dress just like her. 
Her downstairs bedroom and on Beachmont Street was immaculately clean. When she wasn't home, I would sneak into her room covered in posters to borrow her clothes. I always made sure to rearrange the perfectly aligned hangers with finger spaces in her closet, and I always would slide my hang along the carpet vacuum lines uh, to hide <laughs> my footprints. And if I was lucky, her phone would ring while I was in there, and I could eavesdrop on her friends leaving a voicemail on her personal landline. One year, she invited me to sit in on one of her college classes. I remember how above my head it all was and how th I was thinking how smart my sister must be. I, I watched as she earned her degree and became a teacher and I saw firsthand that she was an amazing teacher who truly cared about her students and I immediately knew that I wanted to follow in her career path. <laughs> When I was 20 years old, she became a mother. Logan, you got one of the best. I watched the way she raised you, and I knew that I wanted to be the kind of mother she was. <laughs> I remember the way she used to read the book, I Love You, Stinky Face, to you when you were a toddler, and you used to laugh so hard. She made everything an adventure and so much fun, but she never let you cross the line and you got some of her best qualities. Selfless, smart, kind, hardworking, witty, understanding. And as she grew into an adult, as I grew into an adult, uh, I saw how, how alcohol addiction changed her. And for the first time, I didn't want to make the same choices as her. I was angry instead of empathetic, and I judged her without really knowing her struggles. I wish I had the ability to see her through my children's eyes without judgment. To them, she was the fun aunt who always came with so many toys and games and presents. <laughs> she would paint my girl's nails with her shaky hands while playing Disney music. Or she brought a huge bag full of foam swords for Ernie being sure to reassure me that it won't hurt when he hits his sisters with them. Uh, like all of us, my children will miss her and the fun that she brought everywhere she went. Carrie has the most beautiful soul, and I know that her heart is at peace now, and I know Jesus welcomed her with open arms. My big sister is still preparing the way for me. And I will spend my whole life trying to get my way to heaven to be with her and to continue to follow in her footsteps. Quite beautiful. Thank you so much for those truly heartfelt heartfelt words. So as I sat with Mike and Maggie, I said, you know, I'm not telling you what to do, but this group in some way needs to hear from you too. They need to hear what they should do and how they should handle this. And that's a hard thing. And they say, no, Deej, we got that. We got our family eulogy guy. I said, excuse me? They said, no, we, we have someone who does this at all the family functions. He's really good. And we'll, we'll talk to him, and, and he'll come up and do that. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. But I, I say that because um, I have no doubt the eloquent words we're about to hear, again, come from a, a very special place, that place of family uh, connectivity and that family love. So I'm going to ask uh, Carrie's Uncle Tom on Dad's side. Uh, to come forward and share with us some thoughts. On behalf of Michael and Maggie, Danny, Sarah, Logan, and in Carrie's memory, 
I would like to thank you all for taking the time to be here. In the past few days, the outpouring of love from so many of you is certainly more of a tribute to Kerry than I can possibly muster here in a few words. Thank you. On behalf of my brother Mike and his family, thank you all. No mother should ever see the interment of her baby. No father the loss of his daughter. No son should ever, as a child, see his mother in repose. We are here yet, still in God's grace, trying to understand his choice to give our curry but half a life. When Princess Diana died, her brother Charles Spencer summed this dichotomy with these words. This is a quote. Today is our chance to say thank you for the way you brightened our lives. We will all feel cheated always that you were taken away from us so young, and yet we must learn to be grateful that you came along at all. Only now that you are gone do we truly appreciate what we are now without. End of quote. When speaking of someone who has passed, there's great temptation to glorify their lives, their achievement, their, their character. Sweet, sweet curry, we are of course aware of your struggles and make no motion to dismiss them. We will embrace them and recognize that any of your shortcomings simply made you human, like each and every one of us here. Beautifully imperfect. No one wants to be judged by their worst moment. Any effort to canonize you would simply serve to miss the very core of your being, your wonderfully bright and mischievous smile, your joy of life, the sparkle in your unforgettable eyes, your sense of humor, your insatiable desire to please everyone, and your committed drive to help others, your incalculable energy and undeniable beauty were impossible to overlook. You had a luminous quality, a confluence of radiance, humility, and vulnerability. This is the curry I remember. You were the firstborn in your family and the first grandchild in our family, and your grandma and papa, that's my parents, could not have been more delighted. They called you their number one, and you took great pleasure in telling them that's who you would always be. Right from the moment you came into this world, I was proud of my brother and impressed with this beautiful, bright little girl. I enjoyed I enjoyed the sparkle in his eye watching you grow and the wonder in yours eager to learn about life. Your mom and dad, they glowed in your presence. Your pop-up adored you and you worshipped him. Your grandma thought everything you said and did was brilliant. Fred and Feeney, your nanny and poppy cherished their time with you and they just knew you were simply perfect. Everyone on both sides of your family embraced you, encouraged you, and loved you, and your teachers, neighbors, and friends all treasured you. This is the carry I also loved. Over time, your star continued to shine. With a full academic scholarship to St. Elizabeth, you earned a BA and became a teacher, such an appropriate profession for someone with so much love to give. Accolades rolled in then and now I wasn't planning on doing this, but I've collected a few quotes today from talking to people from her fellow teachers. Curry was a talented and creative teacher and touched the lives of many children. Quote, this is someone who truly advocated for every child. From her co-workers, quote, what a beautiful, thoughtful, kind-hearted, and funny person. Quote, so loved and so special to all of us. From friends, such a joyful person. Quote, one of my sweetest childhood friends. Quote, she loved life and cherished her friends deeply and even as a confidant. And this is a quote, what you meant to my sister had no reasonable explanation. You were her rock. So even in the midst of her own struggle, she was present for others. Many of you are aware that during Hurricane Sandy, she walked neighborhoods looking for people in need and would literally knock on doors of homes that were clearly damaged. It is pretty easy to see the theme that gets repeated over and over here her desire to help others. This is the curry that I respected. I would be so remiss if I didn't mention her relationship with my dad, her papa. There is so much here, I would need to keep you for days, so I'm simply going to try to sum this up in a couple of words. Curry made my father young again. 
His passing in 2009 was within weeks of Logan being born. No one, no one missed the implication here regarding the circle of life and possibly even some flavors of reincarnation. And Logan. Your mom loved you with every fiber of her being. She was infinitely proud of you. She tried her very best to guide you, but also to let you find your own way. The only thing I could think to do here is to borrow a quote I once read that I think is appropriate. If you are to have your son walk honorably through this world, you must attempt to clear, you must not attempt to clear the stones from his path, but teach him yet to walk firmly over them, to not insist upon leading him by the hand by letting him learn to go alone. Logan, you have a loving family behind you, around you, in this room, in your life. Lean on them fearlessly and often. I feel blessed to have had a number of substantive conversations. I knew I wasn't going to be able to say substantive without screwing it up. <laughs> substantive conversations with carry. We have ruminated over existentialism. We've laughed over matters of utter insignificance. In corners of parties and stairwells of family functions, we have resolved that pesky little Israeli-Palestinian con conflict and conspired to take over the universe. <laughs> Still, to me, one of our most memorable conversations came about over a parent-teacher conference she once related to me. She said, Unc she said Uncle Tom, I was entertaining a rather aggressive mom who was unhappy about her perceived treatment of her child in my school and in fact in my class. The woman concluded that all she needed from the education system and from me was fairness. She insisted that the other children were simply getting more attention. Carrie smiled, her very heavily dimpled smile, and she responded with this retort. If your child had a skin knee and another child had an advanced cancer, would it be your wish that I treat both children fairly by administering each a Band-Aid because that would be fair in your model? I submit to you that fair does not always mean equal. Sometimes children require care in order of need. I'm not sure if she knew at the time just how profound those words were. I'm equally unsure if she may have been subconsciously relating a parallel in her own life. This is the carry that I knew well. She has been spirited away from us at the impossible age of 41, and yet when someone passes, we inevitably ask why. Why did God take them from us? There may be a better question, and that may be, why did God give them to us? What do we do to deserve their joy, their love, the sweet moments we've shared, We are now tasked with the forward motion of our lives and we need to be open to recognize the small mercies God will again begin to bestow upon us in the coming days, weeks, months, and years. It is, of course, what she would want. I'm going to close with a short writing by an English priest. The writing is from the perspective of the decedent. Death is nothing at all. It does not count. I have only slipped away to the next room. I am I, and you are you, and the old life that we live so fondly together is untouched, unchanged. Whatever we were to each other, that we are still. Call me by my old familiar name. Speak to me in the easy way which you always used. Put no difference into your tone, no, wear no forced air of solemnity or sorrow. Laugh, as we always laughed at the little jokes we shared together. Play, smile, think of me, pray for me. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without effect, without a trace of a shadow upon it. Life means all that it ever meant. It is the same that it has always been. There is absolute unbroken continuity. Why should I be out of mind? Simply because I'm out of sight. I am but waiting for you for an interval, somewhere very near, just around the corner, all is well. My friends, the human existence is not permanent, and it was never meant to be. That gift belongs to the soul. When people we love are taken from us, 
the way to have them live on is to never stop loving them. Godspeed, Carrie Ann Castles. We won't stop loving you. Thank you, Uncle Tom, for those heartfelt, heartfelt words. Before we conclude our time together, I said there were two readings today that were really for you, Logan, and I, I can't help but think your mother would kind of want to get the last word in, right, in some way. But I think she'd also want us all to take a, a real lesson, not from her passing, but from her life and how she lived it. And so I think this does both. I think it says what she would want to say to you and, frankly, all of us, but it also speaks very much to the Carrie that just navigated this world with a fury of light. A light that I don't think is dimmed or darker because she's deceased, but I think rather it's brighter than it ever shone before. It's by the poet Ashish Ram, and it's entitled The Power of One. One song can spark a moment. One whisper can wake the dream. One tree can start a forest. One word can herald spring. One smile begins a friendship. One moment can make one fall in love. One star can guide a ship at sea. One word frames the goal. One vote can change a nation. One sunbeam lights a room. One candle wipes out darkness. One laugh will conquer gloom. One step must start each journey. One word must start each prayer. One hope will raise our spirits. One touch can show you care. One voice can speak with wisdom. One heart can know what's true. One life can make a difference. You see, it's simply up to you. In a moment, all of you are going to take a first step in many ways. A first step not into a life that's changed, but into a life that's different. Nobody wants to take that step. But we do it together. We do it with the path very well lit in front of us from Carrie. We just have to knock the noise down and remember that. So I thought that the way we should conclude our time really should be the way that Carrie lived her life. So we're going to end everything after this final blessing with a hug to your neighbor. But I'm going to ask you all now to please rise. And I'm going to ask you to outstretch your arms towards Carrie's casket and give her all the energy you can. May the blessed sunlight shine on you like a great peat fire so that strangers and friends may come and warm themselves at it. And may light shine out of the two eyes of you like a candle set in the window of a house bidding the wanderer come in out of the storm. And may the blessing of the rain be on you. May it beat upon your spirit and wash it fair and clean and leave there a shining pool where the blue of heaven shines and sometimes a star. And may the earth, may the blessing of the almighty earth be on you, soft under your feet as you pass along the roads. Soft under you as you lie out on it, tired at the end of day. And may it rest easy over you when at last you lie out under it. And may it rest so lightly over you that your soul may be out from under it quickly, up and off on its way to heaven. Let us all sing.
say. Amen. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In the waters of baptism, Carrie died with Christ, and rose with Him to new life. May she now share with Him eternal glory.
the cross that we have brought here is a reminder of the cross that our Lord Jesus Christ carried in His hour of suffering. And we place it on Carrie's casket in hope that as she has died with Christ, that she will also rise with Christ. Let us pray. O God, <clears throat> whose nature is always to forgive and to show mercy, we humbly implore you for your servant Carrie, whom you have called to journey to you. And since she hoped and believed in you, grant that she may be led to our true homeland, to delight in its everlasting joys. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. The souls of the just are in the hand of God, and no torment shall touch them. They seemed in the view of the foolish to be dead, and their passing was thought an infliction, and their going forth from us utter destruction. But they are in peace. For if before men indeed they be punished, yet it is their hope full of immortality. Chastised a little, they shall be greatly blessed, because God tried them and found them worthy of himself. As gold in the furnace, he proved them, and as sacrificial offerings, he took them to himself. Those who trust in him shall understand truth, and the faithful shall abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are with his holy ones, and his care is with his elect. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks.
reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, no one lives for oneself, and no one dies for oneself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this is why Christ died and came to life, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why then do you judge your brother? Or you, why do you look down on your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bend before me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us shall give an accounting of himself to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabbathani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders who heard it said, look, he is calling Elijah. One of them ran, soaked a sponge with wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. The veil of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw how he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early when the sun had risen on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. They were saying to one another, who will roll back the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. On entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a white robe, and they were utterly amazed. He said to them, Do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. The gathering for any um, mark of respect for the dead, whether it be for a wake or the funeral mass or the cemetery or the gathering after, well, it can never be properly understood in its bigger context without the light 
and the gift of faith. And so it's a blessing that we're all here in this place because it's a place that exists because of faith. And faith is a gift. And I don't know where any of you may be on your own personal journey today, but I do know as a minister of the gospel that God is a generous and merciful God. And the Lord understands us and our pain and our suffering better than we could understand it ourselves. And the Lord is merciful to me right now by bringing me this microphone. (laughs) And the way in which God comes to our rescue, sometimes we don't recognize it. But there is a Father who created us, who loves us, who always is willing our good, who never gives up on us, who understands us, and is always in pursuit of bringing us to a better place. That's who God is. That's the God who created Carrie and gave her life, gave her a beautiful family, gave her faith. And it's also mysterious in this world that we live that with so many good things, we can also struggle with so many painful things. And we all know that too. The human heart is a torturous place for all of us. Poets say it, the scriptures proclaim it. We know it from our own experience. Even on our best days, we know that we're not completely there. We're always missing something. And that missing something is really to be finally united with the God who made us. And nothing in this world is going to satisfy. When we come to celebrate a funeral, there is always sadness, but today there's more sadness because we all think of Carrie being 41 years of age and she should not have died. And we could all have deep questions in our heart about how that could have happened. If there is a good God, how could that happen? And we don't ultimately have those answers. That's why we come and we stand before mystery. God is a God of great compassion, but he is a mysterious God. And our final questions are not answered in this world, but on the contrary, the fullness of understanding only comes about when we stand before the living God at the end of our journey. That is where we are found on today's celebration of this Mass as we offer Carrie and her life to God. And as we come to this Mass, I was thinking of the um, times that I have known her, and met her, uh, baptizing Logan and getting to know her through that process. And there was always something about Carrie that she always wanted good things for other people, maybe more for other people than for herself. And she realized, I think on her best of days, that she wanted other people to experience um, care and goodness and concern. There's so many stories about how compassionate Uh, she was uh, to other people. And no doubt, all of you who know her know that about her, her compassion and her care for other people. So where did she get that? Real compassion and love for other people has to come from God. It's a supernatural gift. We can accept it or reject it. We can become bitter and selfish, or we can become generous and kind. It's a living choice. Many times, over and over, she experienced and express that compassion to others. I also think that when we are confronted with the complexity of a complicated life, that we have to go to the source of our understanding, which is the Holy Spirit. I chose intentionally the reading from St. Mark, which recounts the death Jesus. The death of Jesus for those first bystanders made absolutely no sense. Remember that those who followed Jesus, they were expecting that he was going to be victorious. Remember that the disciples believed that when they got to Jerusalem, that he was going to overcome the powers of this world. That he was going to right the wrongs 
He was going to lift up the poor, that he was going to restore justice, and that he was going to reign as a king or an emperor. And so when the day of crucifixion came, it was absolutely nonsensical. It made no sense. In fact, the disciples were scandalized. They all ran away, except for St. John, who was the youngest, and, of course, the Blessed Mother, and a few women. That's all that was left of the cross. But they certainly didn't have the understanding of the world in that moment as they watched their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ die a very hideous and painful and shameful death. But Our Lady stood under the cross. And that's where I think we have to find ourselves is to stand under the cross when we're looking for understanding that the world cannot give us. In the moments that make no sense in this world, only God can make sense of those moments. The darkest and the most destructive moment in the life of our Lord becomes then the seed of God doing something amazing. The church never proclaims the death of Jesus without proclaiming his resurrection. The second part of this, of course, is the story of the resurrection. When we come to celebrate Good Friday, just a few hours later, we celebrate Easter Sunday. We cannot stand or tolerate Good Friday without Easter Sunday. We cannot confront tragedy in our life if we only see darkness in front of us. There has to be a silver lining. There has to be something more. And that's the thing. If you believe that there's something more right now, God is at work in your heart. That's the power of the Holy Spirit giving you a gift. It's the Christian gift. It's the Christ gift. To see that the deepest and most complex of problems in this world, it's not the definition of life but rather entering into the dark places of life and trusting in the mercy and the love of God and handing ourselves over to his love is the beginning of the greatest thing that could ever happen in our life because it's the beginning of what happened in the world when Jesus rose from the dead. No one expected it. No one realized it could happen. Imagine the confusion and the joy on Easter Sunday morning when they came to the tomb and the tomb was empty. And all their darkest fears began then to elevate and melt. What's happened? What is God doing? And you see, this is what we come to this mass with. There's a realization that God is doing something more. It's only God who can turn the sadness of this day into a silver light. And he does because of his gift of faith. The mercies of the Lord are not exhausted. And you see, when we come with even the slightest glimmer of hope in our heart, it's God at work opening the door to something more. And you see, I would suggest that in Carrie's death, at this moment, that she's giving us a gift. She's letting us know in a very prophetic way not to take anything for granted. That we should not take our family, our friends, the goodness, the opportunities that we have to do something good for others. And to cling on to the faith, the light of faith that God gives to us. You know, we never know how much time we have in this world. We always are in a situation of being dependent on a mystery much bigger than ourselves. And so you see, in a certain sense, we're being given the gift of time, of another opportunity. And from Carrie's place in God's kingdom, she can encourage us not to take anything for granted. 
And the way in which she loved and the way in which she gave herself in this world, certainly she had a lot of pain and suffering in her own life. And the hopeful thing about today is that we believe the life is changed. It's not ended. She has an opportunity now with our prayers and our good works and our sacrifices to continue on that journey of healing. God always intended for Carrie to have peace. He always intended for her to be healed. And now we believe that through our prayers, the gift of the Mass, the gift of Jesus Christ and the faith that He pours out on the earth, that that journey will continue. And the purifying love of God will make her a fit instrument of God's kingdom. We can't take that for granted. We have to surrender to it in faith. Today, as we celebrate this Mass, let us realize that we're very close to the heart of God. We just celebrated this past Friday the sacred heart of Jesus. Do you know about the sacred heart of Jesus? Well, the sacred heart of Jesus is the church's deep understanding that God has a personal, passionate love for us. That Jesus' heart beats for us. And that he's never satisfied with us ever being lost, lonely, in pain, isolated. He's always in pursuit of us in his magnificent love. I think that's a very beautiful image for us to be able to place Carrie in the sacred heart of Jesus in this Mass. That she could have the protection of the Lord's love and his mercy. That we could have the confidence of knowing that the Lord's mercies are not exhausted. And that we would realize that for each one of us, today is a gift. And in the sadness of going forward, we have to have the confidence of resurrection. That God is not finished with his story. He has much more work to do for all, for everyone in this family, for all her family and friends. Carrie's life was not for nothing, it was a gift. And it was a magnificent gift. And we're grateful to God for her 41 years with us. And we pray now that as we hand her over to the love and the mercy of God, that she would now find those healings and that peace that she longed for that only He can give. And may we have the confidence of knowing that one day in God's kingdom that we'll see her again. The mercies of the Lord are not exhausted. His mercies may endure forever. My brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father where he intercedes for his church, confident that God hears the voices of those who trust in the Lord Jesus, we join our prayers to his. In baptism, Carrie received the light of Christ. Scatter the darkness now and lead her over the waters of death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our sister Carrie was nourished at the table of the Savior Welcome her into the halls of the heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy. Many friends and members of our families have gone before us and await the kingdom. Grant them an everlasting home with your son. Lord, in your mercy. Many people die by violence, war, and famine each day. Show your mercy to those who suffer so unjustly these sins against your love and gather them to the eternal kingdom of peace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray in a special way for the health and well-being of B. Geiger. Lord, in your mercy. Those who trusted in the Lord now sleep in the Lord. Give refreshment, rest, and peace to all whose faith is known to you alone. And we especially remember the deceased members of the families, the Castles, the Albies, the Brightons, and the Gorman families who have gone before us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
The family and friends of Carrie seek comfort and consolation, heal their pain and dispel the darkness and doubt that come from grief. Lord, in your mercy. We are assembled here in faith and confidence to pray for our sister. Strengthen our hope so that we may live in the expectation of your son's coming. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, giver of peace and healer of souls, hear the prayers of the Redeemer Jesus Christ and the voices of your people whose lives were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Forgive the sins of all who sleep in Christ and grant them a place in the kingdom. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept this sacrifice at my hands for the praise and the glory of his name, for our good and good of all his holy church. As we humbly present to you these sacrificial offerings, O Lord, for the salvation of your servant Carrie, we beseech your mercy that she who did not doubt your son to be a loving Savior may find in him a merciful judge who lives and reigns forever and ever. 
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. In Him, the hope of blessed resurrection has dawned, that those saddened by the certainty of dying might be consoled by the promise of immortality to come. Indeed, for your faithful, Lord, life is changed, not ended. And when this earthly dwelling turns to dust, an eternal dwelling is made ready for them in heaven. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. indeed holy O Lord the fount of all holiness make holy therefore these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dewfall so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ at the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion he took bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take this all of you and eat of it for this is my body which will be given up for you in a similar way when supper was ended he took the chalice and once more giving thanks he gave it to his disciples saying take this all of you and drink from it for this is the chalice of my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins do this in memory of me The mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and James, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember your servant Kelly, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that she, who is united with your son in a death like his, 
may also be one with him in his resurrection. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints who have praised you throughout the ages, we may merit to be called here as the eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty, Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us all be Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Christ. The body of 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 Christ.
Let us pray. O God, whose Son left us in the sacrament of His body food for the journey, mercifully grant that strengthened by it, our sister Carrie may come to the eternal table of Christ who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. As we come to the conclusion of the celebration here at church, I want to, first of all, extend uh, my own sympathy and, and love and prayers to you, uh, Dan and Maggie and, and Dan and, and Sarah and Logan and your families. Um, this is a, uh, it's a tragic sadness, but it can only be pierced by the, the love of God and his community. And so thanks be to God that you have many loving people who surround you and are with you today. So many people here who are concerned and, and have been touched by Carrie and, and love you. So there'll be great strength as we go forth from here. So grateful to, too to uh, have Father Joseph Cavalli here who also conducted the wake service yesterday and, uh, and our parish deacons, uh, Deacon Mike and, and um, Deacon Dave and, and, and Deacon Steve. Um, the Lazarus community, this is a beautiful community of faith. We're so blessed to, to have them. And I know that, uh, you know that uh, when, we, when, we, when we leave, we have, to, we have to face reality head on, you know? And so let us pray for the grace to see life as it really is to see the good things and the bad things, and to really to know that we don't walk alone, but the Lord Jesus and his blessed mother walk with us, and that all things are possible with God. So let us uh, go to the cemetery with great hope and trust in our heart that God is gonna do great things uh, in our midst. Before we go our separate ways, let us take leave of our sister, May our farewell express our affection for her. May it ease our sadness and strengthen our hope. One day we shall joyfully greet her again when the love of Christ, which conquers all things, destroys even death itself. Into your hands, Father of mercies, we commend our sister Carrie in the sure and certain hope that together with all who have died in Christ, she will rise with him on the last day. We give you thanks for the blessings which you bestowed upon Carrie in this life. They are signs to us of your goodness and of our fellowship with the saints in Christ. Merciful Lord, turn toward us and listen to our prayers. Open the gates of paradise to your servant and help us who remain to comfort one another with assurances of faith until, all, until we all meet in Christ and are with you and with our sister forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
In peace, let us take our sister to her place of rest. The way in which God comes to our rescue, sometimes we don't recognize it. But there is a Father who created us, who loves us, who always is willing our good, who never gives up on us, who understands us, and is always in pursuit of bringing us to a better place. That's who God is. That's the God who created Carrie and gave her life, gave her a beautiful family, gave her faith. And it's also mysterious in this world that we live that with so many good things, we can also struggle with so many painful things. And we all know that too, the human heart is a torturous place for all of us. Poets say it, the scriptures proclaim it. We know it from our own experience. Even on our best days, we know that we're not completely there. We're always missing something. And that missing something is really to be finally united with the God who made us. And nothing in this world is gonna satisfy. There was always something about Carrie that she always wanted good things for other people, maybe more for other people than for herself. And she realized, I think, on her best of days that she wanted other people 
to experience um, care and goodness and concern. There's so many stories about how compassionate uh, she was uh, to other people, and no doubt all of you who know her know that about her, her compassion and her care for other people. Real compassion and love for other people has to come from God. It's a supernatural gift. We can accept it or reject it. We can become bitter and selfish, or we can become generous and kind. It's a living choice. Many times, over and over, she experienced and, and expressed that compassion to others. I also think that when we are confronted with the complexity of a complicated life, that we have to go to the source of our understanding, which is the Holy Scripture. I chose intentionally the reading from St. Mark, which recounts the death of Jesus. The death of Jesus for those first bystanders made absolutely no sense. If you believe that there's something more right now, God is at work in your heart. That's the power of the Holy Spirit giving you a gift. It's the Christian gift. It's the Christ gift. To see that the deepest and most complex of problems in this world, it's not the definition of life, but rather entering into the dark places of life and trusting in the mercy and the love of God and handing ourselves over to his love is the beginning of the greatest thing that could ever happen in our life. Today as we celebrate this Mass, let us realize that we're very close to the heart of God. We just celebrated this past Friday the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Do you know about the Sacred Heart of Jesus? Well, the Sacred Heart of Jesus is the church's deep understanding that God has a personal, passionate love for us. That Jesus' heart beats for us. And that he's never satisfied with us ever being lost, lonely, in pain, isolated. He's always in pursuit of us in his magnificent love. I think that's a very beautiful image for us to be able to place Carrie in the sacred heart of Jesus in this Mass. That she could have the protection of the Lord's love and his mercy. That we could have the confidence of knowing that the Lord's mercies are not exhausted. And that we would realize that for each one of us, today is a gift. The sadness of going forward, we have to have the confidence of resurrection. But God is not finished with his story. He has much more work to do for all, for everyone in this family, for all her family and friends. Carrie's life was not for nothing, but it was a gift. And it was a magnificent gift. And we're grateful to God for her 41 years with us. And we pray now that as we hand her over to the love and the mercy of God, that she would now find those healings and that peace that she longed for that only he can give. And may we have the confidence of knowing that one day in God's kingdom that we'll see her again. The mercies of the Lord are not exhausted. His mercies, they endure.